Okay, welcome to this second webinar in our Train Talks at 12 series. Um, today, we're going to be looking in a little bit more detail about wear and rolling contact fatigue damage. So following on from last month's webinar, just introducing friction management, we're going to start now taking a bit more of a detailed view of the damage mechanisms and how friction management can be applied to mitigate these particular damage mechanisms. So for those of you who didn't manage to tune into the, to the first webinar last month, I'm Jackie Butterfield um, and I am the lead applications engineer for LB Foster in Europe. And as before, my colleague Zoe Loveday is here to assist and she's going to keep an eye on the chat and field any questions that you might have at the end of the webinar. Uh, I hope that some of you were able to catch our first webinar last month, but for those of you who weren't able to, um, it was recorded and a link to the recording is available on the LB Foster website. So today I'm going to begin with a brief recap of what we talked about in the first webinar as to why we need to control friction in the wheel rail interface. And then I'm going to go into more detail about the mechanisms of wear and rolling contact fatigue. And, and where and how they occur. And then we'll follow on looking at the friction management solutions that are available, uh, and also a little bit more in depth about the consumables that we'll use for tackling wear and rolling contact fatigue. And then I'll finish up the webinar with a few case studies where friction management has made a significant difference to wear and rolling contact fatigue. And I'll also remind you of the upcoming webinars that we've got in this series. So, as a recap from the first webinar, we looked at why we need to control friction. So, friction is required. Without friction, there would be no movement. Um, however, uncontrolled friction at the wheel rail interface may lead to a number of issues and damage mechanisms, and they're, they're listed here. So, we'll be covering a lot of these in our webinar series. So moving on to wear. So wear in its simplest definition is a loss of material from the surface of either the wheel or the rail or indeed both due to their interaction with one another. So here we have two relatively rough and hard material surfaces in contact moving relative to each other and resulting in generation of friction and heat and also under the influence of force. As well, as we looked at in our first webinar, we also have this third body layer, which sits between the wheel and the rail and also influences wear and allows us through friction management and manipulating that third body layer to actually control the friction and influence those damage mechanisms. So wear and wear rates can vary in severity from mild to severe. And there are wear modes or wear mechanisms uh, by which material can be lost. Um, and these can vary between mild and severe, um, and there are different types. So these include adhesive wear, oxidative wear, abrasive wear, fatigue, and also seizure, which can be very, very severe. And these types of wear are often associated with specific areas on the wheel and the rail and so we'll be looking a little bit about that too. So the pictures you can see are some examples of severe wear uh, and rolling contact fatigue damage to rail and wheels. So the first one I'm going to look at is adhesive wear. So adhesive wear is typically seen at the gauge face or the gauge corner of the wheel of the rail and the wheel flange. Uh, this mode of wear is uh, predicted and dictated to some extent by the Archard wear law. Um, so the equation you can see here in the grey box. So the volume of material that is lost is proportional to C, which is a, a, a wear coefficient, which is proportional in itself to the coefficient of friction. 
Um, the other uh, the other variables in that equation are N, which is the normal load, L, which is the contact distance or slip or creep, and H is the hardness of the materials. So the whole kind of uh, parameters influence that volume of wear, which volume of material which is lost. So it will depend on the weight of the vehicle, the materials that are using, the grade of rail, and also the track geometry, which will dictate L, which is the slip distance. So how this mechanism works is that the wheel and the rail surfaces are relatively rough, as you can see on the, the stylized diagram there. So we have peaks on the surface of the wheel and the rail, which are, are known as asperities. And in adhesive wear, under the force and the heat and the friction in the wheel rail interface, these asperities or peaks, they actually touch each other and then they bond and weld to each other. So you're having on a micros micros microscopic scale, the, the wheel and the rail is bonding to each other. But obviously the wheel and the rail are moving. So as the wheel moves, then these asperities get ripped apart uh, ripped off and they form wear debris. So what this does is it leaves a fairly rough surface behind and very uh, large wear debris particles, which can actually be visible on the, on, on the rail and on the foot of the rail and on the track. So this, this type of wear is characterized as being severe to catastrophic. Um, so the bottom two pictures that you can see are a couple of examples of gauge face wear in, in heavy haul freight in, the, in North America. So you can see in the picture on the left, you can see that it is a very, very rough surface that's left behind. Um, and in the picture on the left, again, you can see that there's a lot of damage to the gauge face of the rail, that pieces of the, of the rail are actually coming away from the gauge face. But if you look at the rail foot, you can see the wear debris there. So you can see the silvery particles in the in the track bed and on the side of the rail. So this is adhesive wear. So the second type of wear I'm going to look at is oxidative wear. Um, and this is usually or typically associated with the top of rail um, and, head rail, and head wear or wheel tread wear. Not exclusively, you can have multiple different types of wear mechanisms in each of the types of uh, each of the areas on the wheel and the rail, but oxidative wear is particularly associated with top of rail. So rail steels are high carbon steels. They are not particularly corrosive resistant and so that they will readily oxidize in the presence of oxygen and air and other uh, oxidizing agents and, and chemicals. So in air, obviously, most railways are in, in the outdoors and there will be oxygen there. Otherwise, the passengers wouldn't be able to breathe. Um, so you will have an oxidation of the surface of the rail. So what happens here, it causes the formation of a brittle but very, very thin oxide layer on the surface of the steel. So as the wheel moves, this oxide layer sits on the top of the steel and the force and the relative motion separates that oxide layer. So it skims it off the top of the, the rail. The oxide layer is, is removed as wear particles and debris. And then the cycle will begin again and you'll get regrowth of that oxide layer. So this is a constant process of, of oxide formation, removal and regeneration. So under the, the a scanning electron microscope, this is what the surface looks like. So the darker gray is the oxide layer and the, the lighter gray is the, the underlying steel below it. So this layer flakes off and forms wear debris and, uh, and, and particles, which then end up in the third body layer or end up in the, in the track bed and the ballast. So this type of wear is often characterized as being mild to severe, depending on the environmental conditions, and tends to leave a smoother surface than the adhesive wear. 
and much smaller wear debris particles. So topper rail wear can be very extreme. Um, and this is just a, an example picture of some headwear from a, a North American railroad. This particular picture was part of a derailment investigation. Um, I would not say that this is due entirely to oxidative wear. I would think this was probably due to adhesive wear as well, due to extreme conditions. Um, but the, the headwear um, that you can see can be very extreme and you can lose a lot of material from the head of the rail. So moving on now to rolling contact fatigue. So this again is a type of wear because it does lead to a loss of material. But the mechanisms behind it are fatigue. So a cyclic pattern of stress on the wheel and the rail associated with the rolling motion. So this damage mechanism really came to prominence after the Hatfield train crash in 2000, in which uh, a high speed train derailed and four people died and over 70 people were injured. And the following investigation identified that the rail had fractured in several places due to rolling contact fatigue damage. So it can be a catastrophic failure of rails. It also occurs on wheels as well as, as the rail. Due to high lateral forces in, in curves and high creep forces, this is, the, this is the, the underlying mechanism for rolling contact fatigue. And so while the train is traversing sharp curves, you have a repeated plastic strain at the surface and the subsurface of the steel. And this leads to the generation of small, shallow cracks initially, which form underneath the surface of the rail and then grow to the surface of the rail. Um, and it can lead to shelling and delamination of the rail. But in some cases, the cracks can actually turn down through the rail and cause catastrophic failure, as we saw at Hatfield. So sometimes you'll hear as rolling contact fatigue being referred to as RCF, and there are a number of different types uh, that are associated with different areas on the rail. So one of these is gauge corner cracking. So this occurs at um, the, the gauge corner of the, of the rail. Um, and the other is head checks. So we have a couple of example pictures here. So we have head checks uh, in the left picture where um, the material is actually delaminated and, and spalled off. So these shallow cracks have joined together and, and, and then resulted in a loss of material from the head of the rail. And then we have the gauge corner cracking in the right hand corner. So you can see a pattern of very, very fine diagonal cracks on the corner of the rail. Um, and these are the, the rolling contact fatigue or RCF cracks. Now, rolling contact fatigue can also be influenced by contaminates, contaminants in the, in the wheel rail interface, particularly waters and oils and other, and other chemicals. And what happens here is the water will actually, through capillary action, will actually seep into the cracks and pressurize or hydropressurize the cracks and open them further. So for the, the phase of crack growth, which leads to the turndown of, of the cracks down through the rail head is often associated with hydropressurization. of predicting uh, whether you will get rolling contact fatigue is to use a shakedown diagram. Now this is a diagram which uh, on the x-axis you have the traction coefficient so effectively the friction involved in in that particular wheel rail interface and then up the y-axis you have a load factor so this is a ratio between P0, which is the peak pressure. So this is the maximum pressure 
experienced on the rail during wheel rail interaction divided by a material strength factor, Ke. So what you're looking at here is you're seeing different areas of reaction of the steel to the friction and the loading. So at the bottom, you have elastic behavior. So effectively, you've got reversible behavior. And then as you move up the diagram, you start to get plastic and irreversible damage behavior. But what we want, we don't want to happen is the ratcheting effect. So this repeated cracking and crack growth. So you effectively want to stay to the left of the red line. Jeez for that. I hope you can still hurt me. Yeah. Thank you, Carlos. Yes, we, we lost internet connection for a little while there. Uh, uh, you couldn't hear me screaming, uh, fortunately. So just to recap, anything anything to the to the left of that red line is acceptable and, and deemed to be safe. Anything to the right is is to be avoided. So how we can change that behavior is that uh, we can either change that K factor, the strength factor, so we can use a high grade steel, a high strength steel, or we can reduce the stress, that peak stress. And we can do that by um, changing the wheel and the rail profiles to change the behavior of the contact patch and the stresses in the contact patch. And the other thing we can do is to reduce that traction coefficient, i.e. to reduce the coefficient of friction. So obviously this is where friction management can take a leading role in preventing rolling contact fatigue damage. Another way of looking at rolling contact fatigue where and where and actually predicting it is to use a T gamma damage factor, which is a, a calculated factor based on vehicle dynamics and also the wheel rail inter interaction. So you can actually predict what the predominant damage mechanism will be. So T gamma is made, out, made up of the tractive force and the slip in the wheel rail interface. So effectively, it's a function of the frictional energy which is dissipated in that contact patch. Um, there was a piece of work done in the early 2000s which actually developed what's known as a whole life rail model. And this allows you to look at T gamma values and actually predict what will be the predominant uh, damage factor. You have T gamma along the X axis and then you have areas on the graph where you have rolling contact fatigue damage only a mixture of rolling contact fatigue and wear, and also wear. So what you can do by controlling those T gamma values, you can actually balance between rolling contact fatigue formation and actually wear. So some railroads call it the magic, the magic wear rate. So what you're trying to do is balance the wear rate with removing those shallow rolling contact fatigue cracks so that they never get to a stage where they will turn down through the rail and cause catastrophic failure. So this is used in, in a number of models and it's used by Network Rail in their Track X model, which predicts uh, rail damage and allows them to look at what friction management um, and also what track geometry uh, mitigations they need to use to uh, reduce damage. So we'll move on to what we can actually do. So what are the friction management solutions that we can use? So in the last webinar, I introduced the various types of, of friction management and explained that for each area of the wheel and rail, there are many options to introduce friction management products into that interface. 
So looking firstly at gauge face wear and also wheel flange wear and wear to the check rail or guard rails and also to some extent rolling contact fatigue on the, the gauge corner. We have trackside equipment uh, which can dispense friction management products to those interfaces and typically here we'd use grease. We have the option of onboard solid stick hardware. So we have our solid stick lubricant products. And then we have onboard spray systems, which can spray oil onto the wheel flange and, and therefore transfer onto the rail as well. And for those, we use oil. Um, as LB Foster, we don't supply any oil spray systems. So I'm not going to be covering those in any detail but I just wanted to mention them for completeness because they are there, they're available um, and they work. So here we are aiming for a coefficient of friction, ideally as low as possible, but somewhere around 0.1 to 0.2. So what we're trying to do here is, if you think back to the diagram where I talked about adhesive wear, we're trying to keep the, set, the, the surfaces apart and as separate as possible so that those asperities, those peaks in the rough surface don't get a chance to, to bond together and rip apart and form the, that wear debris. So we're trying to lubricate as low as possible to prevent wear damage. So looking at top of rail and wear and rolling contact fatigue, we have the same options in terms of hardware. So we have trackside equipment that can uh, dispense product to the top of the rail, and these are friction modifiers. We have onboard solid sticks, and these are again solid sticks, but they are applied to the wheel tread rather than the wheel flange and have a slightly different formulation, which I'll talk about in a little while. And then we have the onboard spray systems, which spray friction modifiers onto the top of the rail. So here we're looking at a target coefficient of friction of between 0.3 and 0.4. So we're adding material, but we're not reducing the friction sufficiently to affect traction and braking. So just a quick recap of uh, trackside equipment that we looked at in our first webinar. So there's a variety of equipment available for, for trackside application. So we have the mechanical systems, the hydraulic systems, electrical systems, which can be used for gauge face or top of rail. Um, the bars of the applicator bars are typically placed at the start of the curve or in the transition into the curve or the spiral for the North American uh, and South American colleagues listening. Um, and check rail bars are available to apply product to the check rail to prevent check rail damage. So here we have mechanical unit, hydraulic unit, electrical unit, and a couple of pictures of uh, bars. So we have a gauge face bar and also a check rail bar. It's very difficult to see it, but you can see that the check rail bar sits on the top of the, the bar and then dispenses the product or almost dribbles it down the side of the check rail so that it's lubricating the, uh, the check rail and the back of the wheel as it traverses that tight curve. So we also have the onboard solid hardware. So we have options for flange, wheel flange applicators, tread stick applicators and back of flange applicators. So the stick is applied continuously to the wheel by a constant force spring. Doesn't have any electrical or pneumatic connections. It's a purely mechanical system. Uh, so it doesn't have any control system. It doesn't need to integrate with the electrical system of the, of the vehicle. And the stick consumption is self-regulating because it works on the equilibrium of friction between the wheel and the rail. And in some cases, it can negate the need for any trackside flange lubrication in shallow to moderate curves. 
Third option is the onboard top of rail spray, which we looked at last time as well, which sits on the vehicle and sprays material onto the top of rail. So this consists of a product tank, control system and nozzles, which spray material onto the, onto the track. So it provides the same benefits as a top of rail trackside unit. It, it has intelligent control. It can be GPS controlled or other control methods so that it only dispenses material at the precise location when and where and whenever you need it. But the added benefit is that the maintenance takes place in the depot. So you don't have to send people to track to maintain top of rail trackside systems. And so in terms of health and safety, it's a much better option. So now looking at the consumables themselves. So for gauge face uh, application, we have greases. So the grease uh, for rail application is formulated specifically to be able to withstand the forces in the wheel rail interface. So any grease will not be, may not be sufficiently uh, robust enough to survive in the wheel rail interface. And so the, the greases essentially function as a sponge. So the, the lubricant is the base oil and that sits within the grease matrix. And as the, the wheel rail forces interact with the grease, the oil is squeezed out of that sponge and distributed along the track. So they consist of a base oil, which is roughly 80% of the grease uh, constituents, and that can be a mineral oil, a synthetic oil, or even a bio-based oil. And into that, you add thickening agents at about 10% and also another 10% of additives. So these additives can be various formulations for corrosion resistant, antioxidants, uh, deactivators, anti-wear additions, anti-scuff um, additives as well. So we're looking for a number of key physical characteristics for these greases to survive in the wheel rail interface. Um, first is viscosity. So the, you need a specific viscosity to perform and they ideally they need to have a stable viscosity range over a range of temperatures so that in summer it will provide the same performance as it will in the depths of winter and obviously there the greases different greases can be formulated for either a summer winter grade summer grade a winter grade or an all season grade you need to be pumpable you need to be able to pump them through the equipment uh, lubricity, so they need to lubricate effectively and give a low coefficient of friction. They need to have retentivity, and retentivity is a measure of how long the grease will last in the wheel rail interface. So a good grease will last a long time, um, so that sponge is a very strong sponge and it will squeeze out the oil in a very, very controlled manner. So you're not, it's you're not going to get all of the oil released all at the same time. It's going to last a long time and carry down the track a long distance. Biodegradability is also a, a key characteristic and very important to customers, particularly in Europe. And there are different grades of biodegradability. And there are other characteristics as well, such as toxicity and flammability. So there are ways of testing the greases um, in a laboratory and in the field. And in some of the later webinars, we'll look in more detail about these. So onboard solid sticks. So these are molded segments and to fit into the applicators. They come in a ver variety of shapes and sizes. They have an interlocking feature which helps to reduce stick wastage. Um, and the coefficient of friction that they give is for flange sticks. So they will give a coefficient of friction of less than 0.15. 
And for the tread sticks, they will give an intermediate coefficient of friction between 0.3 and 0.4. So again, we're looking at key characteristics for sticks. So we need a high lubricity, particularly for flange sticks. So we need that low coefficient of friction. We need a high retentivity. So we want the stick film to last a long time on that in that wheel rail interface so that the stick consumption rate is, is kept low. Um, they need to have good mechanical strength. These sticks are in an applicator which is attached to the bogey frame of the vehicle. So it sees a very, very high amount of vibration and acceleration. So they need good mechanical strength. They need to be thermally stable. Uh, wheel rail interface temperatures easily get up to above 300 degrees centigrade, and in some cases up to 500 degrees centigrade. So the sticks need to be thermally stable so that they're not going to just disintegrate or melt. Um, and they need to have a good, strong interlock feature. Again, we can test sticks in a laboratory. And on the right hand side, you've got an example of a twin disc test. So this is measuring effectively the coefficient of friction that you get uh, with the stick, um, adding the stick for a specific amount of time, in this case is 200 seconds, and then removing the stick and then plotting the coefficient of friction and how that material is exhausted in the wheel rail interface. So you want the stick to give a low coefficient of friction, so below this red line, below 0.15, and then you want it to last as long as possible, so the product retentivity and the, the test is dictated in the European standard, EM15427, uh, which dictates that a 200 second stick application, to pass the test, it has to go below 0.15. And then the retentivity is the time between the removal of the stick and when the coefficient of friction reaches 0.4. So you can see that this compares three different sticks. Um, some are good, some are not so good, some are not very good at all. And then the final type of material is the friction modifier. So there are several types available on the market. Um, these can be oil-based, uh, oil, grease-based, a hybrid mixture of water and oil, water and grease, or purely water-based. So here I'm only going to be talking about Keltrak, which is LB Foster's water-based uh, friction modifier. So there are various uh, trackside and onboard formulations available. And we also have formulation, formulations specifically for heavy haul freight as well. So the key characteristic of Keltrak is that it is purely water-based. It contains no oils. So it dries on the rail to form a thin film. Um, it does not affect braking and traction, and we have uh, extensive uh, braking trial data to prove that. It provides an intermediate friction level, so between 0.3 and 0.4, and it has positive friction characteristics. Um, I'm not going to go into positive friction characteristics at the moment because um, that's very, very key to noise and corrugation, and that's the next couple of webinars. So I'm going to talk a lot more about positive friction in the next couple of webinars. It's non-flammable. Um, it gives a consistent performance range uh, a, a, across a very wide temperature range from minus 20 up to plus 40. Um, and it's non-flammable and it's environmentally friendly and it's non-toxic, which is very important. So finally, and I realise that I'm overrunning by quite a bit, but uh, excuse my enthusiasm, mm. um, just look at some case studies where wear and rolling contact fatigue have been mitigated by friction management. So this first one is an example of reduction in gauge face wear in North America in a heavy haul freight line. So this is one specific curve of 175 meters radius. So this is a timeline effectively of gauge face wear. 
So we start at the left hand side in 2015 and we have a, a timeline from 2015 up to 2017 and you can see the trend in wear over that time. So the, the average wear over that time is 0.195 inches for every 100 million gross tonnes uh, passed. So then in January 2017, friction management was implied in uh, was um, employed, and then shortly thereafter, the curve was re-railed. So the red vertical line is the re-railing. So now with friction management, you can see over the next year, two years, there is a much lower trend in gauge face wear. So the wear is, is, is reduced quite considerably. So it's reduced to 0.12 inches per, for, per 100 million gross tons. Then in January 2020, uh, the whole system was reviewed and the some of the friction management units were moved in order to optimise their position. Um, and shortly after that, there was another re-railing again. So brand new curve, brand new rail. And since then, you can see that actually the gauge face wear is virtually zero. So by optimising the position of the friction management units, um, we can achieve a zero wear rate effectively. So the second one is a, a top of rail um, example uh, on rolling contact fatigue. So this is a laboratory test that was carried out in Austria in the first Alpina full, full scale test rig. So this was uh, used to simulate the, the rail wheel contact, uh, comparing dry rail conditions with a top of rail application, in this case, Keltrak, with a dry wear situation. So the pictures show on the left hand side, you have a brand new rail profile. The centre is a section of rail which has gone through the full scale rig um, and top of rail material has been applied. And you can see that the rail is pristine. There's no damage at all to it. And then on the right, you have a dry rail that has gone through the same amount of cycles uh, as the FM applied rail. And you can see very clearly that you have rolling contact fatigue cracks forming on the gauge corner, and you also have wear. So you can see the difference in profile between the top of rail, rail um, applied rail, and also the dry rail. And then the final case study is a onboard solid stick um, case study. So this was Kuala Lumpur Expo Airport Express. Um, so during the commissioning of this uh, network, um, excessive flange wear was, uh, was experienced and they projected that the wheel life for the for the vehicle was only going to be 170,000 kilometers which was effectively four and a half months so from new way new wheels to scrap was four and a half months so obviously not acceptable so the solution was to fit the fleet with um flange sticks lcf so lb foster lcf sticks at coverage of 30 percent of the axles um, so in the graph at the bottom right, you can see that the, the wheel life, so this is wheel life, not wheel wear. So the control is the dry. So you have a very, very low wheel life. They actually tried, first of all, to manually grease the, the, the wheels, which increased the wheel life a little bit, but not very much. Then they added 30% flange sticks. And you can see that the wheel life jumps up significantly. Um, they wanted to improve it further, so they then increased the number of applicators on the vehicles to 45%. So you can actually see on the, um, on the schematic of the vehicle where the applicators were, were fitted. 
So they fitted uh, additional applicators, but only on one side. And this is because the track was predominantly curved to that side. So you're getting more wear on one, one side of the vehicle compared to the other. And this, in turn, uh, increased the wheel life, again, quite significantly. So there's a, just three case studies that uh, we can we can use. We have many more. Um, if you want more case studies, then please get in contact um, and we can provide case studies from all over the world in terms of trackside and onboard solutions. So finally, finally, today we've gone through a little bit of a recap on why we control friction. The mechanisms of some of the wear modes and also rolling contact fatigue. The friction management solutions in terms of the hardware and the consumables. And also just some brief case studies on where friction management has made a big difference. So coming next, um, we have our next webinar on Wednesday, the 6th of November at the same time. 12 UK and that will be on noise mitigation and then that will be followed in December with corrugation damage, uh, January low adhesion, energy consumption, March derailment, derailment risk and finally in April a look at validating friction management, how to get the best out of your friction management solution and how to do trials as well. So we've got a few guest speakers coming up in the in the forthcoming webinar, so you don't have to listen to me all the time. So I would like to thank you for listening and I apologise for going above time, but it's a very complex subject and a lot of detail to get through. So if you have any questions, uh, please pop them in the chat and I will do my best to answer them. No. Oh. Everybody wants their lunch. Yeah. So do I. <laughs> <laughs> well, if we have no questions, I hope to see you all next time. Bye.